Matt. Um, I work on gov.uk as a web operations engineer. I work on the infrastructure team, so we're kind of like a platform team. Um, we focus on automation and building tools for that. So gov.uk is a single domain for the UK government. Uh, so we provide public service information, uh, such as when the next bank holiday is. Worldwide, British embassies rely on our website to publish essential travel advice, and so that's 24 hours a day. And we also, we're also the portal for uh, user services, such as registering to vote. And we also provide calculators for figuring out how much um, maternity or paternity pay you're entitled to. Um, during events of uh, national significance, we're, we're the publishing platform for government. So during the election in May, uh, we hit the button to end the previous government and start the new one. And we um, archived all of the policies relating to the uh, previous government, so they're marked as such, so that uh, users have a historical record, so they can see the difference between the last government and the current one. So as the canonical source of information for the, for the UK government, we have um, users that really depend on us for our availability and our integrity. We have over 300 government departments that use us, and uh, we have 12 million unique we uh, weekly visitors. So in order to serve our users' needs, our integrity and availability are really important. Today, I want to talk to you about coordinating unattended server reboots. So this basically means um, that our servers can reboot automatically overnight without any manual intervention. So first of all, I'll talk about why this is important and why it's useful. Um, what's included already in Ubuntu by default, uh, so that's uh, what we use. How CoreOS um, applies automatic reboots and how we implemented the same mechanism for Ubuntu. And then what did we learn from this and how, how did we make it better? So why are unintended reboots, why are they useful? Who remembers this? How many people lost sleep to this? So we, we patched this pretty quickly. Uh, we patched it within about four to six hours of Ubuntu releasing the update for it um, for most of our servers and then within 12 hours for the rest. Um, so quite a manual process. We had a few people involved, um, but we got it done quickly. So some, some uh, security updates that require a reboot, so it might be a kernel upgrade, might be a libsl, ssl upgrade, and you could restart um, individual services that are affected, so if uh, you're running Nginx with, uh, that relies on libssl, you could just restart Nginx, but that's kind of error prone and a very manual process. Um, so you might as well just restart the whole server. Um, we shouldn't be afraid to do this. Um, it's good to return to a known state, um, and our system should tolerate it. So rebooting service seems like the easiest way to tackle this, and at gov.uk, we, we have a team that uh, specialize in, um, they're, they're focused on uh, responding to alerts and uh, monitoring our metrics. Um, and they're quite a small team. There's uh, two developers and a web operations engineer, so uh, similar to a, a system administrator or a site reliability engineer. And this team, they work in a weekly rotation. Um, so every week, this team changes. And we try and make them as self-sufficient as possible. We have a, quite a wide pool of people that get involved in this team. Um, and so uh, they might not know all the parts of the system. Um, so we, we try and document everything. We have a, an operations manual for this. Uh, if an alert appears in Isinga, that's our monitoring system, um, then you can click a, click a link and find documentation about why this alert is appearing and how you might go about um, fixing it. And if, if the second line team can't deal with an issue, they'll escalate it to one of the uh, product teams or to uh, the infrastructure team. And so. The key thing about GovUK second line is that it has to be um, as self-sufficient as possible. Um, they can't escalate problems further up, but if, if they can deal with it themselves, then great. So rebooting servers uh, manually takes a lot of time, and we found that uh, the second line team were spending a lot of time during the day, during our peak traffic periods, um, having to be really careful about which machines they reboot, and so it, it wasn't an, an ideal situation. Um, and we, we like to automate things as much as possible. Uh, manual work is really tedious, and so we'd rather automate it where we can. We thought, how can we approach this? And uh, there's some things included in, uh, in Ubuntu already. Uh, we use unattended upgrades. Um, and what this does is it runs daily, uh, usually on a morning, in the morning, it runs as part of cron.daily. Um, and this will upgrade any packages that have security updates. So we only, we only upgrade um, if there's a security update or if, uh, if there's a bug fix or a feature that we need. Um, so that way we can try and ensure the system's as stable as possible. So um, yeah, unattended upgrades, it works, um, but the, the new up updates don't take effect until, uh, as I said, the services are restarted or the servers are rebooted. So unattended upgrades has this mechanism for uh, rebooting the servers as soon as the up update uh, is, is applied. But if, you, if we were to do that across our whole estate, um, everything will re reboot more or less at the same time. So we splay the times at which cron.daily uh, runs. 
we run in a virtualized platform, so we want to try and reduce the, the I.O. burden of um, having everything run at the same time. So we looked at elsewhere and to, to see what else is available, and um, we, we looked at CoreOS. So for those of you that haven't heard of CoreOS or not that familiar with it, um, CoreOS is a, a re relatively recent operating system. Um, it's very lightweight. Um, it's interesting because it uses a, a read-only uh, file system for the operating system. And then any applications that you want to run on it, you run inside containers. It's also interesting because the way that CoreOS updates is very similar to the way that uh, Chromium OS or the Chrome browser updates. And they use a system called Omaha. And CoreOS have, uh, have built upon this same system. The way that, the way that CoreOS updates is that you have an active passive uh, partitioning scheme for the root partition. So um, by default, uh, in this state, uh, CoreOS is, um, is installed on uh, the partition A. And when there's an update, it gets installed into partition B. And then when the server is rebooted, we, we boot from partition B. Um, this is neat because it also allows you to do uh, rollbacks of uh, the root partition. But as you'll see, it's really important uh, that you reboot the server for this uh, update to take effect. So reboots are a, an important part of the CoreOS um, update strategy. So what, how does CoreOS do this? So CoreOS has a, a tool called Locksmith. Uh, Locksmith basically allows uh, each CoreOS server in the cluster to reboot one at a time. Um, so you're not rebooting everything all at the same time. And Locksmith uh, uses um, a mutual exclusion, exclusion lock, or a mutex, uh, which is stored in etc.d. So etc.d is a part of CoreOS. Um, it's a key value store that's distributed. So you have a cluster of etc.d machines. Uh, we have three. Um, Etc.d uses a, an, an atomic compare and swap operation. So what it does is um, when Locksmith wants to obtain a lock for a machine, it will speak to Etc.d and it will, it will um, ask Etc.d, what's, what's your state at the moment? Where, where is your index at? And Etc.d will respond, it'll say, okay, so I'm at index five and uh, currently I have no machines that are locked for a reboot. And then what uh, Locksmith does is it takes this uh, information that it knows already and then goes back to, uh, to etc.d and says, okay, uh, I have this information about the state that I know about um, and I, I, want to, I want to lock this machine. So maybe I'm running a cash box and I want to lock this cash box. I know that last time I talked to you, nothing was, nothing was locked, so can I go ahead? And this atomic compare and swap uh, mechanism is really, is really useful for um, distributed lock services because it provides us uh, some kind of guarantee that only one machine is going to reboot at once. So etc.d is uh, a distributed key value store, as I mentioned, um, and it uses Raft as the consensus algorithm. So in an etc.d cluster, you have um, a leader machine and you have uh, followers. So the leader it basically is the, it's the machine that determines uh, the state. XRTD uses the Raft consensus algorithm to determine who is the leader. Um, and Raft, um, I'm not going to go into the details of how it works now, but there's a really good visualization in the URL at the bottom of the slides there. Um, and I highly recommend you, if, if you're interested, uh, have, a, have a watch of that tutorial, and it's, uh, it, it, it's very, very good. Raft is uh, it's an improvement on the Paxos um, algorithm, or, or rather it's an attempt to try and uh, simplify it and make um, consensus algorithms uh, more easy to reason about. CoreOS looks really interesting, and yeah, it would be nice to use it, but we're not using it right now, um, and we're using Ubuntu, and we have a lot of servers using Ubuntu. So how can we apply the same mechanism to, uh, to Ubuntu? So as part of Locksmith, uh, there's this small utility called Locksmith Control. Uh, it's a really small utility, it's very simple, and what it allows you to do is query the status of the reboot lock it allows you to lock a machine or unlock it. And so we, we uh, used Locksmith Control and, and uh, used it with Ubuntu. So we started uh, prototyping uh, this in Bash. So really simple. We got, uh, installed Locksmith Control on all of our, our, all of our machines. And we had a, a Bash script um, that ran as a cron job. So the cron job ran between a reboot window between midnight and uh, 9 AM. And so the machines would reboot overnight. Um, and what this uh, cron job did, it ran every minute and it will go through a series of steps to decide if it was safe to reboot. So the first thing that the script would do is it would check for the existence of a file called var run reboot required. Um, this file is just a, a flag on disk. So um, for those of you familiar with Ubuntu, there's a package called update notifier common. And what this package does is whenever uh, um, there's a package that needs a security update applied to be applied, um, after that update is installed, 
um, that, that package will hook into um, update notifier. An update notifier on the behalf of the package being installed will create this file called var run reboot required. So by the presence of this file, we know that a machine needs to be rebooted. And if you've, if you've logged into a Ubuntu machine, you'll see uh, it tells you, you need to reboot this machine. That's what it's looking at. So the first step is, does that file exist? If yes, we need to reboot. The next thing we do is we check if the machine is safe to reboot. So we set an environment vari variable which is configured using Puppet to say which machines are safe to reboot overnight. Um, we'd like to be in the position where everything can be rebooted, but we're not quite there yet. So for now, we, we have this, uh, we have this um, check to make sure if it's safe to reboot the machine. The next step is uh, we, we don't want to um, exacerbate any problems. Say if there's a, a problem in our monitoring system, maybe there's a, an alert somewhere, we don't want to reboot machines if it's going to make things worse. So what we use Isinga for our monitoring system. Um, it's similar to uh, Nagios. It's a fork of Nagios. Um, but the neat thing that Isinga provides is a JSON endpoint, which allows you to query what alerts are in the system. Um, so what we do is we check if there are any uh, warnings or critical alerts for mach machines in the same uh, machine class. So if I'm a cash box and I want to reboot, I check if, um, I check if the, there are any other uh, machines within the, uh, the cluster of cache nodes that have uh, warnings or critical alerts. And if they do, we abort the reboot. So assuming that's OK, we go on to the next step, uh, and we obtain the re reboot lock. So again, uh, remember this is a bash script that's running on a cron job. And basically, what, what we do is we run locksmith control lock, and we um, acquire the reboot lock. Um, if, if that fails, locksmith control will return a non-zero exit code, and we abort. If that goes ahead, then we reboot the server. Or if uh, all of these didn't work, so maybe, uh, maybe there was an alert, or maybe uh, another machine already had, uh, had the reboot lock, we then uh, wait another minute before trying again. So the cron job will try again in another minute during this uh, reboot window. So when the machines boot up, we release the lock. So on each machine, we have an upstart task. It only runs once on boot. Um, and all it does is try to unlock the, it tries to release the lock for the machine that uh, the upstart task is currently running on. So if I'm a jump box, I'll say, release the lock for the jump box. If the jump box doesn't have the, uh, the lock, then the command will fail, but it doesn't matter. That's OK. Um, yeah, we, we might see machines rebooting unexpectedly, so we just continue at that point. That's, that's fine. But the, the key thing is that we have to release the lock so that other machines can, can go ahead next time. So uh, we had so, something we were quite happy with. So we, uh, we tested it in our um, development environment, which we call preview. Um, and then we, we released it to staging. Um, and our staging environment is identical to production, as, as, close, as close as we can get it. Um, and we replay our traffic from production into the staging environment. So we replay all of our HTTP GET requests into staging. So we can, have it, we can see similar traffic patterns uh, in our staging environment as we do in production. And so we soak tested the system in staging. Uh, for a few weeks, we're a little bit nervous about rebooting things overnight when uh, you know, no one's around to, to check it um, without, without getting woken up. Um, and once we're happy with it, we rolled it out to production. So here's a graph of uh, one of the first nights uh, that, that this ran. The neat thing about this is every single, uh, every single line here, every single vertical line is a different machine. So each, each call is a different machine. And you can see that they're, they're rebooting at an equidistant time um, between them. Yeah, and this, this just happened without any human intervention. That worked great, um, but that's not the end of the story. So how, how did we make it work better for us? First thing we did was we noticed that sometimes, uh, so unattended upgrades would run at like half five in the morning um, to update uh, packages that needed updating. But that's not ideal if, uh, if a, a package is available at midnight and then we only upgrade it at half past five, then we, only, we can only reboot a small number of servers. Uh, and then we have to wait until the next day before stuff gets rebooted, or we have to reboot stuff manually, which we're trying to avoid. So the, re the way we solved this was just to run unattended upgrades from midnight every half hour and to try and maximize um, our use of the reboot window, to try and make sure we could reboot as much as possible in that, within that window. Uh, the next thing we did was, um, so locksmith control is quite a simple utility, and it only supported talking to one etc.d endpoint at a time. Now, etc.d is distributed, so, and it runs in a cluster. So if you're only talking to one of the nodes, you're not really making use of the cluster. So we added um, a contribution to locksmith control. We raised a pull request. It's open source. Um, and to add support for talking to multiple etc.d endpoints. Um, we're really keen on, on open source at the Government Digital Service and on GovUK. 
Uh, we think it makes things better by keeping them open. Um, so we try and contribute back where it makes sense for us to do so. And we make uh, everything that we do as much as possible, we make it open and uh, open source where we can as well. So the next thing we did uh, was we increased the time uh, between reboots. So we were running this every minute. Um, and it was, it was a little bit too quick. Uh, we had some, machine, some uh, applications um, that were taking a little bit too long to, uh, to start up. And so uh, we figured out that one minute was probably too much for us at the moment. And so we increased this, uh, this time to, uh, to run every five minutes. And for us at the moment, this is fine. This means we have enough time to reboot all the machines within an estate um, within, that, within that reboot window. Uh, the next thing we did was we re rewrote parts of the script from Bash to Ruby. Um, so one of, the things that, uh, one of the things that Bash script was doing was it was checking the Icing uh, JSON endpoint for, to check for alerts. And to do this, we were using curl and grep, um, which kind of worked, but not always. Uh, not always as reliable as you'd like. Um, it was, was an, un, unable to distinguish between Icinga being, un, uh, being unavailable and there being a genuine problem. Um, so obviously, if Icinga is unavailable, we would abort the reboot because we can't tell what the state of the alerts are. Um, so we rewrote, rewrote this script in Ruby, which uh, made it much easier to write tests for it, um, which we're also really keen on. Um, we also had a bug where um, when we were querying Icinga, um, we weren't anchoring the regex pattern that we were using to search uh, which alerts there were. Um, if you've got a, re a regular expression, you've got two problems rather than one, right? Um, so we, uh, yeah, we had to fix that because otherwise uh, we were querying too many machines and so an alert that uh, was occurring for a machine unrelated to the one we were about to reboot would prevent us from rebooting. So it made rebooting harder. And the other thing we did was that we reduced our, our reboot window. So we started to notice uh, between like eight and nine, uh, we had uh, some, uh, an elevated uh, 500 error rate for um, one of our applications. And so uh, we realized that we were getting too close to our, our peak traffic uh, period by running up to nine o'clock. So we, we reduced this from uh, midnight to, uh, to 6 a.m. And so the last thing, the, uh, the, one of the last things that we, we encountered most recently is a kernel loops. So we're applying these security updates straight away um, but not all software is reliable, right? I mean, yeah, it's software, right? Uh, so yeah, we encountered a, a kernel loops in the Ubuntu kernel. And yeah, it, this could happen in any distribution, not just Ubuntu. Um, and this was uh, an interaction between the kernel and audit D. And so if you had certain audit D rules, um, then the kernel would oops. And this was probably exacerbated by the factor on a virtualized environment because it was a race condition. Um, so uh, one morning, our second line team came in and there was, um, there was about three machines that were pretty much unusable. So um, we, we, this raised the question of should we update uh, things straight away? Should we, test, uh, should we update them in staging first and then apply them in production? But these are security updates. Like what if we'd left Heartbleed running in staging for a couple of days and then only then applied it in production? That's no good, right? So at the moment, we haven't come up with a, a good solution for this. Um, thankfully, these kind of kernel oopses are rare in our experience. We, this is the first we've seen like this. Um, but we still have our monitoring checks as well that will prevent the reboots from going ahead. So for the moment, we're happy that this is rare enough that, um, that it sh shouldn't cause us any problems. Um, Locksmith Control also now supports uh, machine groups. So you can reboot uh, several machines at once. Uh, so that's something that we're looking at uh, using to try and increase the amount of uh, servers we can reboot overnight if we, if we need to add more servers. Um, so the Puppet module that we use to orchestrate all this is open source. Um, it currently supports Ubuntu only at the moment, uh, but if you want to add support for other operating systems, pull requests are welcome. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please do uh, add a GitHub issue, and you can see the URL at the bottom there. Um, and if you're interested in uh, more about what we do in the UK government, um, in the Government Digital Service or on gov.uk, uh, you can see our technology blog where we publish um, some of the things that we, we get up to. Thank you very much.